Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 78 of the podcast. It's the 25th of June, 2017, as I record this intro. And it's Q&A time. Uh, This month, Anna Brown joins me again to answer your questions. We dig into questions around boredom and busyness, kids getting themselves dressed, integrating the needs of parents, and helping a child through deep disappointment. It was so interesting how we found a thread through them all, the time and space for conversations and insights to bubble up. We don't need to find answers right away. Those in-between times can be uncomfortable, but it's in there that so much growth and goodness happens. And you may have noticed I'm recording this intro a few days early because Lissy is coming to visit tomorrow. She and her boyfriend are staying for a week, and I want to keep our possibilities open, so I'm doing as much podcast prep beforehand as I can. And I imagine I'll share a bit about what we got up to next week. And I want to say thank you to everyone who has chosen to support the show on Patreon, and a big welcome to new patrons Jay-Z Courtney and Anna Pereira. Thank you so much for joining us. And I noticed that we're super close to the next goal. When we hit it, I'll create a private group for supporters where we can chat about unschooling and you can easily share show feedback and suggestions like topic and guest ideas with me. I'm really looking forward to that because as I've said before, you guys inspire me. I deeply appreciate all my patrons and I love that you're helping me share unschooling information with anyone who wants to explore ways to live this wonderful lifestyle with their family. And if you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And I'd also like to give a big shout out to my transcription team, Nicole, Yolanda, Anita, Madeline, Amber, Maggie, Amy, Anna, and Alice. You guys are awesome. You're full of enthusiasm and you take such care. It's a pleasure to work with you. And I know the transcripts are definitely appreciated. Some people prefer to take in information through reading rather than listening. And I love that the wonderful experience and insights that the guests share are available in both formats. You guys rock. And this week, I want to share a quote from the episode, something Anna said. I think if we can just be aware that we don't have to hold all of this weight ourselves, that we can have conversations, that we can include our children, that that just helps us move forward through all these different things because it's a common theme. It doesn't really matter what the situation or issue is. If that same solution is to just open up and have conversations with each other. When there are challenges with our children of any kind, that responsibility feels so heavy, doesn't it? We alone must solve things quickly and hand everyone else the quote right solution. But that is weight that we're putting on ourselves. And it's a bit presumptuous to think we know what's best for everyone involved, even with children. Children are capable of so much if we open up and give them the opportunity. They really, really are. And with that, on to your questions. Welcome to another Q&A episode. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca, and I'm happy to be joined today by Anna Brown. Hi, Anna. Hello. Hello. Just to let you guys know, Anne is taking care of herself at the moment and not able to join us this month. And hopefully she'll be back next month, but Anna and I are looking forward to answering your questions. So would you like to get us started, Anna? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so question one is from Vanessa in beautiful British Columbia. About six months ago, I was seeking out homeschooling podcasts and I stumbled upon exploring unschooling. I was hooked. This has been our first year of homeschooling slash unschooling our nine-year-old girl and 10-year-old boy, and I have been bouncing between the two methods. Luckily, I live in the best province for homeschooling, and the school 
we are full, where we are with fully supports the child-centered approach. What I have found the most fascinating about unschooling is how natural it felt. I've been unknowingly unschooling my children their whole lives, and the transition from traditional school to natural home environment has been a very easy one. The more I listen to your podcast and the wonderful guests you have on, the more confident I feel about our choice. On to my question. I... I'm an only child and I spent a lot of time on my own. Along with that came two words that now as a mom make me cringe. I'm bored. My own mother's response was always the same. Use your imagination. My eight-year-old self would be so disappointed in me as I have succumbed to using the three most dreaded words of my childhood. When my children say they are bored, I feel as though I am failing at unschooling. I don't even think that can be possible, yet here I am trying to fill the day with busy work just to avoid boredom. So I ask you this, did your children ever get bored? How can I help my children fill their day without directly influencing their activity or interest choices? Many thanks, Vanessa. So, hi, Vanessa. Um, I think we can maybe give too much power to the word bored. And, you know, I see that you're kind of taking it personally when really it's just a passing state, a state that can often push us forward into something new. It can also be something that starts a conversation about our days and what's going on and what do we want in those days. Um, Anne actually sent us a few thoughts on this question when she knew she wouldn't be able to join us. And she started off with the definition of bored, which is an adjective feeling weary because one is unoccupied or lacks interest in one's current activity. This is also from Anne. It's so perfect. It's so benign. There's absolutely nothing wrong and everything right with that definition. The definition shows that bored is exactly the space that is needed in order to stretch and grow out of where we are and becoming who we can be. Listen to that weariness. Allow your body, mind, and spirit to be at rest. That's when you can best listen within, listen to intuition, and guide you to your next steps. So I loved that from Anne, so I wanted to include it because I think that's really it. I think it's about observing, you know, taking it as a sign that they're ready for a shift and that you don't have to take on the energy of it. It's just a word. It's just an expression like any other. It's not a sign of failure on anyone's part, but an expression of where they are in that moment. It can be something that can be actually embraced and welcomed, you know, toying with that and how that energy feels so different can really open up opportunities. And since this is a trigger from your past specifically, I'm kind of curious what you as a child would have wanted to hear from your mom. And I think that might be interesting to explore. So it's just some things to think about and maybe not taking it on Amanda Palmer has a book called The Art of Asking, and in it, she says, we'll continue on with the behavior, and she calls it sitting on the tack until it hurts too much to get off. And I think boredom can be a similar thing. It's like we're restless, we maybe want something new, and we get to this point of, you know, I'm bored, and then that spurs us on to the next thing. So I feel like it's probably part of the process. And, you know, letting go of it as this big, scary thing, I think, can change up the energy a lot in the family. Pam, what about you? I loved your point about, uh, you know, thinking about what you, Vanessa, would have liked to have heard Mm -hmm. from your mom, right? When when you were expressing that feeling. Uh, that ties nicely with, uh, you know, Vanessa, you, you said your, your eight year old self would be so disappointed in you. Um, that's, that's kind of a way sometimes Lissy and I have conversations about that. It's so interesting to think about what, um, our previous point of view, our previous perspective mm-hmm. would be versus, you know, our perspective now, um, because that it, it's so interesting to see how it changes over time. Anyway, uh, I do love that you're revisiting the eye of the idea of boredom and realizing that it's a trigger for you for that particular reason. And I know in the last Q and a episode, we talked about the idea of boredom. Um, and maybe you probably submitted your question before that, but just to reiterate, as Anna was saying, being bored really isn't necessarily a bad thing. Now as a mom, definitely, uh, when I heard that it was a clue for me to consider whether or not I was offering up a variety of interesting options and helping them do the things that they have already said that they want to do. But beyond that, really, uh, it can often be part of the process of learning more about ourselves, uh, as the definition, uh, that Anne had looked up, 
Uh, maybe our interests have waned and we haven't yet found something new that excites us. So I don't think it uh, helps us to think of our goal as filling the day with busy work to avoid boredom, because I don't think the opposite of boredom is busyness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's not a problem to solve so much as it's just a feeling that we're experiencing. So just as we wouldn't try to whisk our children through feeling sad, I don't think we need to whisk them through feeling bored. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because in that time of not knowing, it, it's that, that bit of uncomfortableness that has us stretching our mind to figure out something to do. And it's in there that we can find so much insight and creativity. It's funny, the other day, Joseph and I were talking about how incredibly valuable time is. I think that's one of the huge benefits of the unschooling lifestyle. It's that time to do nothing in particular. We're so scared of that in-between time that we always need to be doing something, that if, if we're not productive, at least we're not being lazy, right? But if we mm-hmm. keep, yeah, it, it's such a big thing, isn't it? And if we, it, it, is. it is, and I find if we keep jumping in to occupy our kids when they say they're feeling bored, our actions to try and quickly solve that imply that those are feelings that need to be fixed. You know, that's the message we're giving them without even saying it out loud, you know? So I think to, um, sit with those, you know, it, it's still uncomfortable. It's, you don't need to celebrate it and go, yay, yay, we're bored. <laughs> but you don't need to fix it, right? You can commiserate, you can empathize, you can hang out, you can do quiet things, you can just be with them and be an example of sitting with it, with them. And and uh, just each time you go through that, they will see that there's another side that, oh, you know, I don't know exactly what I feel like doing right now. I'm going to sit with it for a while and see what comes up because after a few times they'll realize something will eventually bubble up. And then there's that curiosity even in those in-between times. It's like, I wonder what's going to come up, you know? So that's something that, that I found over the years as we work through those times. Yeah. And so and I have a couple different thoughts swirling around after your conversation, you know, with Joseph about time, because, um, you know, we've always unschooled and really I, we didn't hear a lot of I'm bored when we're younger. But I think, you know, as a society, we kind of value this busyness and filling the time and doing. And I think it is really a gift of unschooling that we have this time that stretches out. And so I think it might be good for people that are experiencing this to check in are they trying to fill their own time? Are they busy, busy, busy? Because I know here, if I'm getting too busy, it actually, I'm, it's a sign for me. Stop. Yeah. I want those, I want those moments to unfold. I want that feeling of, I don't have anything to do right this second. What do I want to do? And I know when we actually still do it, I was going to say when my kids are younger, but we do it now, you know, if I, when those moments come, it's let's go sit outside, you know, let's just listen to the birds. <laughs> let's just do. And it's, it's valuing that quiet time too. And so I think when we're rushing in to fill and do and make, we always have something going on. We're setting this expectation and we're, we're laying this foundation that, Oh, okay. We're always supposed to be doing something. And so we really value here at our house, just not you know, mm-hmm. just having that open space mm-hmm. and really cool ideas bubble up from that. So I, I really, I guess it is really a kind of a paradigm shift that people can try on and see how that energy feels for their home too. But anyway, I'm going to think more about this concept of <laughs> the time and unschooling <laughs> after we get off. <laughs> and then you just reminded me, I am, uh, I haven't gone back to it in the last couple of weeks, but I've been reading a book called Rest and oh. the value of that in between time. And I know I have like I have, a, I have a ton of things on my yeah. quote to-do list, right? And I'm super excited about every one of them, you know? So, but I'm consciously not saying, oh, I'm busy, I'm busy. Because each yeah. one of those is a choice. And I'm also yeah. choosing, I had this conversation with Rocco just a couple of days ago. Um, because his challenge is when he chooses something, he gets right focused in it and he can't release Mm -hmm. Um, even when he wants to. So, I mean, that's the judge. It's, is the person uncomfortable? 
right? right? It's not what are they doing? But even when I have lots of things that I want to do, I'm also um, cognizant of, of taking rest breaks, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And doing something like this morning, I've already been out. Um, we mowed the lawn a couple of days ago and I was just out, um, clearing the grass, you know, mm -hmm. off, off the porch and stuff. Cause it gets traipsed, traipsed around, but it making, having those quiet moments, um, in the day, just where there's no particular thing that my thoughts can just bubble that's yeah. where that inspiration is. Like Anne said, you know, mm -hmm. and that's the time when you can best listen within, listen to your intuition to guide you to the next step. And I know I have always, you know, so many um, interesting ideas and stuff pop up unbidden. I need to give my subconscious those free times to pop up. You know right, what I mean? exactly. for it to appear so yes that was all very interesting <laughs> it was <laughs> thank you Vanessa <laughs> yes and question number two is from Alex in France uh hello I hope you're having a good day yes thank you I was wondering if you could help me with one small issue I have been helping my children to wear their clothes from their birth but now they are four and six both are boys and they still ask me to help them they actually do not really participate or very rarely participate. So I put their clothes on alone. Um, recently, I was thinking that probably they should do it themselves. And I have been keeping asking them to do it alone. And each time they do not agree and they ask me to help again and again. I don't mind and I do it with love and patience. I was just wondering what your attitude about it. What is your attitude about it? And should I push them to do it themselves or should I wait until they are ready? They are already, they already put on their shoes and jackets themselves, but not the other clothes. Should I wait until they are ready or should I ask them more firmly to do it themselves? Very kind regards, Alex. So Alex, thank you very much for your question. And for me, when questions like that arose, I'd often look at the words that I was using to tell the story to myself. Because if I found I was using the word should, that was often a big clue for me that I was starting to let expectations cloud my perspective of the situation. So for skills like this, ones around taking care of themselves, I'd rem uh, often remind myself that they aren't going to be 18 years old and I'll still be doing this. So like dressing them or dishing up their plate of food or, you know, whatever it was at the time I was struggling with. Um, I'd remind myself of the things that they were doing, like you've done uh, right there in the question, mentioning that they put on their shoes and they put on their jacket and that this particular thing just isn't on their radar right now. And that's OK. Their mind is busy with whatever they are happily doing while you put their clothes on. And even if there's a particular something that's stumping them right now so that they are choosing to avoid it like maybe they have a hard time with buttons or are, are uncomfortable putting um, something over their head you know that is perfectly okay too when it becomes important to them they'll naturally take it over um, so you can let them focus on what is important to them now and keep getting themselves dressed as a future mystery as in you know I'm curious I wonder when they're gonna start dressing themselves um, you know you can just Again, always going back to to the child and and noticing, well, this is what they're doing. This is what they're interested in. And, you know, we'll just wait and see how this turns out instead of putting my expectations on top of it. What about you, Anna? Yeah, very similar. I, I mean, I, I feel like there are a lot of these kind of things that come up as our children are growing. And I've just always taken the approach to let it come naturally because sometimes we don't know what's behind the request. And by that, I mean, they may like you dressing them because it's special time with you. It's a comforting ritual to the start of the day. And when it comes to these things like going to the bathroom, dressing, sleeping alone, reading alone, like you said, plate, putting food on their plate, um, you know, for most children, we can pretty safely say they won't always need you for those things. And honestly, the time passes so quickly that I really wanted to cherish those moments because one day is the last day that they'll ask for help and you won't know it. It'll just happen. Yeah. And I don't want to rush those last times because they come quickly enough. 
if there's something in you that needs it to change, some reason that it isn't working for you, I feel like that's a different story. But if you're only concerned because other people think they should or they are, quote, supposed to, you know, by some outside standard, I would encourage you to let those things go. And because like Pam, I use those words as red flags for myself. Where's that coming from? A should is pretty much always coming from somewhere outside of ourselves. And so it's a good red flag. Um, just focus on your boys and the joy you're having with them because it, it sounds like it's it's working. And again, if it's not working for you, then that's a, that's a place for you guys to dig deeper and figure out, okay, how can we make this work so that we all three feel good? But if it's just coming from outside expectations, you can let those things go. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great point. That difference, you know, to take that time to realize where it's coming from. And yeah, if it's if it's from outside expectations that you're feeling you should be passing on, then yeah, those are a lot easier, you know, to to work through. And and if if not, if it's something else, then yeah, that's that's the start of another conversation and another kind of fun brainstorming to try and figure out a way to move through it where everybody's, you know, needs in the situation can be taken right. care of. Yeah. Okay, so I'll go ahead with question three, which is um, anonymous. Okay, hi there. I am the mom of two kids, a daughter, seven and a half, and a son, six. We have been homeschooling for three years. My daughter went to preschool and have been on a steady road towards unschooling. Your podcast has been an invaluable resource for me on this journey. I, I have two questions. Both kids love TV and video games. At the moment, I... OS games and online platforms are sufficient for them. However, my son is in love with YouTube videos where he watches people play games on other platforms, Nintendo, Xbox, etc. The issue I foresee is with my husband. He has issues with gaming and finds it easier to manage with iOS or online games. But, excuse me, but the second a game controller hits his hands, he can't leave it. He will become obsessive about playing, stays up all night, and gets hostile towards anyone who tries to interrupt him. Therefore, we have kept these things out of the house. We are aware that this has to do with his past, but he's not terribly willing to do the work to deal with the problem head on. I wish he would so that we can have these devices in our home to allow my son to follow his delight. So I guess I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the issues that arise for parents when their children's delights are triggering like this to to a parent. I know that for myself, I have welcomed these triggers and see how they are opportunities for me to grow. But what about a resistant partner? Um, I'm going to read question two because it's short and then I'll get to both of them. Do you have question two is, do you have any thoughts on the introverted parent who unschools extroverted children? Thanks in advance and my deepest gratitude to you three lovely ladies. Okay, so for part one, um, I guess I just feel like it's an opportunity for conversations and for finding new solutions. You know, it could be things like the consoles kept in the child's room or put away when your partner's home if he works outside the home. Um, I also think he could share his concerns with your kids. You might find that they choose to keep doing online games to make it easier for their dad once they understand the situation. I guess I feel like transparency will help keep anyone, it will help keep everyone feeling heard and understood. I think if we're making decisions and not talking about it, so we're keeping the consoles away, but maybe the kids don't know why we're keeping the consoles away, then they may just feel that they're being misunderstood or you don't understand how much I like this or want this. But when everybody's talking, you know, then they can go, oh, okay, I get it. This is why we're making this decision. Let's let's decide as a family. And you'll be reaching the decisions together as a family, understanding everyone's needs in the situation. And I feel like those conversations where we're sharing deep parts of ourselves are so valuable to the loved ones in our lives. And it's a skill that will be helpful for the rest of their lives because we're going to keep bumping up against triggers and baggage and all kinds of things as we interact with the people in our lives. And so being able to to put words to it, being able to have conversations around it, being able to come up with solutions that are gentle with each other. You know, these are just the wonderful part, I think, of our unschooling lives, because again, it's that time we're together, we're able to have these conversations, we're able to look at these different aspects and nuances. It's not a top down or decisions being made without everyone aware. So I really love that piece of it. So those are just some things I would think about and 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 maybe talking more to your partner. But And I'm wondering if when he's involved in the conversation, 
with the kids when everybody's talking about it, if you might find it does give him some opportunities to look and, and examine his own feelings about it. It doesn't have to be this big, you're going to go deep and you're going to examine now, <laughs> but just, just having the conversation may give him an opportunity to go, you know what, but I do see that this is bringing joy or no, I'm feeling scared about this. And, and again, those vulnerabilities and that honesty can just really open up a lot of connection for all of you. Um, so part two was the piece about an introverted parent and an extroverted child. And I think first, I just think it's so helpful to be aware. <laughs> I think it's so it's awesome that you're even thinking about it <laughs> because you will hear me talk about similar issues I, more for, from the reverse because I'm thinking of the extroverted parent and the introverted child being the introvert. I'm, I'm that advocate, you know, but um, I think, again, it's that open conversation can really help to not only find solutions, but to help you both understand each other, because I think think that's really important. It's I've talked before about how my best friend is an extrovert and I'm an introvert. And she really had no idea about the differences until we became friends, which would have been in, you know, her 40s. <laughs> so so it, it's so great to have those conversations early about different needs and how people gain energy and how they feel in different situations. And so then once everybody's kind of understanding each other, I feel like you can look for opportunities to meet those needs. And you can look for opportunities that maybe feel less draining. So maybe there's some drop off play dates or friends coming over that, you know, one or two friends coming over versus a large thing. Um, plan the activities so that you can get downtime to recharge between the outings. You know, I think just talking about your different needs will help you find ways to meet both of your needs. You know, we are all introverts here, but I definitely have, um, you know, a child who really likes to be out socializing with friends. And so for me, I had to just keep it so that there was a balance for me so that, okay, we could be out, she could have those opportunities, but then I would get some downtime and then we tag team with other families so that she could then have more time and she would go over to people's houses and, you know, would just be doing more than maybe I could do myself, but I could find those opportunities for her. So I, again, I think if we can just be aware that we don't have to hold all of this weight ourselves, that we can have conversations, that we can include our children, that that just helps us move forward through all these different things. You can see it's a common theme. It doesn't really matter what the situation or issue is. It's that same solution is to just open up and have conversations with each other. So Pam? Yeah, I love that point because that that's one of the huge shifts with unschooling, I think, is the realization of how capable children truly are you know they're able to have these conversations they're they're able to come up with wonderfully valid and useful suggestions and ideas and take in information you know we it, it's something that conventionally we don't um think of children that way right it's so <laughs> easy to think well we're the adults we're the parents we need to make the decisions up front and then tell them Right. It, it can feel so scary to open up the conversation um, because we're always we always think that children don't have um, value to add to it, that they're just going to come up with some crazy kid thing. <laughs> and, and, you know, then then we're going to be stuck with it. No, no. You know, you'll be amazed when you open up conversations with them because because it's, it's not even about yes or knowing ideas that they have right it's it's just it's that time <laughs> right it's, yeah. it's that boredom it's that that staying in that space for a while and just seeing what bubbles up you know it, that goes to so much of the questions right Giving, it really does it really does that space for things to bubble up uh we don't need answers immediately right on on so many of these um issues these conversations you know, we don't need to know yes, no, right now that our child needs to be dressing themselves or that we need to fix their boredom or that we need to have a path forward on on games or whatever it is. Conversations and time are beautiful. Um, but yes, uh, I'm just going to look over my notes for that first question. And I love <laughs> that um, they, her... Uh, the questioner and her husband have recognized that this is a trigger for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And as she mentioned, we, of course, don't have any control over when they may feel ready to talk about it or process it. Uh, 
you had a great point that maybe even just, you know, having a bit of conversation with the kids might help. Um, but you don't pin any hopes on it. And it sounds like at this point, avoidance is his strategy. And that's definitely one can, one strategy that can work. And that's great. Um, now what's coming up is your son's growing interest in those uh, other gaming platforms. So as Anna mentioned, that can be a way to start opening up the conversation. So I think it's it's important to remember that it's not about convincing your husband to try and tackle this challenge head on, but about um, trying to find some ways that you can support his avoidance strategy and your son's interest. So as Anna mentioned, <laughs> like keeping the console in uh, your son's room rather than out in the family area, maybe playing when dad's not home, you know, brainstorming all these possibilities that might fit in with your particular lives. So that's having the conversation and, and including the kids in that. Um, but, uh, something that I wanted to mention, it also might be useful to step back and revisit your prediction that your husband is going to have an issue with it. So consider how you describe the situation. You wrote, uh, the second a game controller hits his hands, he can't leave it. He will become obsessive about playing, stays up all night and gets hostile towards anyone who tries to interrupt him. So you may, may have created that story in your head before moving to unschooling. And this new way of looking at people's interests and passions, especially when it comes to technology and games. So maybe you can retell the story through the lens of unschooling with a more favorable view of his passion. Like, he loves to play console games, and once he has a game controller in his hands, his focus and concentration are amazing. Sometimes he's so engaged that he finds it hard to be interrupted and chooses to stay up late. Because, I mean... Mm -hmm. That sounds like me if I get into a zone with reading or writing, right? <laughs> so maybe you guys can revisit the idea that he has an issue. Maybe what he's got is a passionate interest that you can support alongside supporting your children's. Uh, so really, back to what I mentioned before, it depends on how he sees things. That's the wonderful thing about unschooling. It's not just about for our kids, right? It's for everyone. How does he see this? Does he see his behavior as detrimental to himself? Is he okay with being tired the next day when he stayed up late playing games? Does he feel like he's missing out on things with the family because he stays in that zone for a long time? You know, sometimes we're so worried about opening that, that we will be opening up a can of worms with something. But maybe we created that can and, and closed it up before we began unschooling. And now we can open it up and maybe we see something completely different. So it's just, again, conversations and, and seeing what you find and not being scared to open up the conversation, you know, right. instead of being worried that you open up the can, something pops out and you need to address it right away. Give it space. Give it. It's okay if you have that uncomfortable space for a while and see what bubbles up. Um, for the second question, introverted parents and extroverted kids, for me, as Anna mentioned, it was about being open about it. And yet, uh, what really helped me was also being willing to step out of my comfort zone. So I was always checking in with myself, wanting to be careful not to use it as an excuse, while mm -hmm. also taking care of myself. You know, that is also important that my needs are met so that I don't feel like I'm going to burn out, that I don't feel like I'm being taken advantage of. So I would dig into my thoughts and feelings because I am loath to trying to guilt myself into anything. <laughs> you know, so when I'm trying like, oh, I should do this. I, there's that word again, right? Should, should, should. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I would have to get to the roots. I'd like, oh man, I got to figure this out. So if I really felt that I couldn't swing something, I would be upfront about it. You know, I'm tired or, you know, whatever it was that I was feeling at the moment. But I would also work hard to not be a roadblock. Like you mentioned, you know, other people helping out, going, visiting other people, getting rides from other people. I would try to find another way to make that thing happen um, and keep expanding the possibilities of what it was they could do, just not roadblock it because... I wasn't the one who would be able to do it with them. Right. 
And on the other hand, so many times when I made that shift out of my comfort zone, I was amazed at how wonderful things turned out. So, you know, after I'd done it a few times, it, it became, you know, there are possibilities there. So there were always, there are positives either way, you know, taking care of myself and stretching myself and what kind of situation was it this time. And I would also find ways to re-energize myself while we were out and about too. I remember sometimes we'd be lining up for a show a couple hours, two or three or four hours, you know, before doors open <laughs> and I would be reading or I would have my headphones on and I'd be listening to uh, music or I'd be listening to a podcast or, or something. So I, I found ways that I could address my uh, energy needs. I didn't have to always be home to do that. You know what I mean? Right. So again, it's just brainstorming and and thinking outside the box, really. Just thinking about ways that I could that I might be able to meet everyone's needs along the way. So that was always fun. Even, even asking them conversations with them, they would, kids have amazing ideas. Always. You know? That's always. True. So it's so much fun. Okay. We better move to question number four, which is another anonymous question. Okay. Uh, our son is about to turn nine and is an only child. We belong to a homeschooling community where we meet once a week for a field trip and once a week for park day. He enjoys it. The other days we spend at home for the most part, as my husband and I both work from home, albeit not full time. Our son loves Minecraft, Skyping with his homeschool friends, and just started playing Roblox. We've always had unlimited time on the computer, and he's on it from when he wakes up until he goes to bed, literally. When we leave anywhere, he wants to use my phone to watch videos to and from the places we go. We just went to the grocery store where he spent the whole time watching my phone to and from and while in the store. He spends more time watching a screen than not watching a screen. I'm sad about this, as he doesn't engage with me or my husband, doesn't want to eat meals with us, we suggest only dinner with us, isn't the kindest person to me, etc. I offer other things to do and he's not interested. I ask him to not get my phone from my purse when we get in the car and he grabs it anyway and says, ha ha. We went on a week-long trip without access to a computer and no internet and I saw the kid that I once had. Interested in things more joyful, playful. I miss him. I beat myself up for not having another child, but I had him at almost 44. I feel he watches YouTube videos to pass the time because there's no one else around to spark interaction with. I support him by getting food and drinks for him throughout the day. I feel disrespected and of no use to him. My husband thinks he is disrespectful too, but offers no assistance to the situation. Any thoughts about sorting out these feelings? And then she added later, I want to expand on it as my son opened up last night about his desire for a sibling. He was crying over it and it breaks my heart. He said if he had one, he could play all the time with a brother, his preference. He said if a kid is walking on the streets, we could take the kid home. We talked about the adoption process more. We have homeschool friends who adopted three siblings and he mentioned that if they could do it, so could we. He said that he watches and plays videos a lot because he doesn't have anyone to play with, which relates to the earlier question. I offered suggestions like more playdates. No, he wants a kid to be with us all the time. I offered more playtime with us, mom and dad, and he said no, he wants a brother. I woke up crying. He asked why we didn't have a kid right after we had him, and I didn't know how to answer. I focus on how we are so happy that he was born, and he said, why didn't we start earlier so as to have more than one? I had my son when I was almost 44, and my husband was 48. We met and married in our late, in our early 40s. My husband didn't want another child, and I was on the fence. I feel like he's going to grow up thinking back on his childhood and summarizing it as a lonely time because he didn't have a sibling. He's mentioned it throughout the years. He turns nine in one week. I can see how his life is so different than those with a sibling. There are positives and negatives to both. I get that. I have eight siblings and my husband has five. I feel like I'm letting him down and not supporting him. We could do X, Y, and Z, but the underlying wish he wants realized just won't happen unless we adopt, which I hadn't really entertained seriously until now as he was so emotional about his desires. My heart is heavy. So big, big hugs. And I know that heavy heart when we can't always make our children's wishes come true. 
And I wanted to say, this is, this is how things go when we leave that space, you know, that time that we've been talking about a lot this episode, for conversations to flow, that this conversation came up and she came back to add this information later. You know, the, this is how things go. It, it doesn't need answers right away. Because so often we don't get that whole story at once. So often we don't even know our own whole story at once. It comes to us in bits and pieces of insight. Um, it's wonderful that he is comfortable sharing his thoughts and feelings with you. I thought that was amazing. And sometimes we are going to be disappointed about circumstances. And so are our children. You know, this is all a part of life. And you can commiserate with him and empathize with him. And it's not something that you can or need to fix for him. Over the months and years, you can share stories with him about growing up with lots of siblings, uh, the good and the bad, as you mentioned. There's positives and negatives. It's not about judging one as better or worse. It's just different. And if he's looking for more interaction with other kids, make that extra effort there over a long period of time. I know, you know, when you first bring something up, as you mentioned, I said, well, we can, we can play more. Um, you know, you, you can do more things with us. We can play more with kids. And of course, his first um, reaction is going to say no, 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 because that's where he's fixed. But you don't need to ask permission for these things, right? You can just do these things, offer these things up over the longer, over the longer period, you know, when, um, his attention has shift, shifted a bit out of this space of, of his dream of a brother, right? There's always other opportunities, but you, that's one thing, you know, instead of asking, um, our children, or even, you know, anyone, anyone, um, setting up a situation where they can say yes or no, right? You don't need to ask yes, no questions. You can just offer, do things, something that he loves doing with you guys. You know, is it going to a movie? Then just say, let's go to a movie, you know? Um, and instead of saying, can we play with you more? Just offer it more. If he likes to play card games, um, do that. If he likes, to if you find a new video game, you know, if, if there's something that if he really just likes YouTube stuff, immerse yourself in that and and share videos that you find. Um, connect through those things that he enjoys without asking for permission. Yes, no, you don't have to point out. See, look, we're we're playing, we're playing, we're having fun. <laughs> um, just do those things. Just bubble up that life. And let's see, um, ba -bum. you mentioned that, uh, just some ideas. You mentioned that he enjoys homeschooling outings and park days. So maybe in just invite one or two of those kids over more, you know, that if there's some kids that he enjoys hanging out with at those things, um, invite them over once or twice a week. You don't have to point that out again, just say, Hey. Um, so-and-so can come over to play. Um, you can make a point of mentioning, uh, group activities. Uh, maybe you find more, look for more things besides just those two outings during the week that, that he might enjoy. But just, again, don't say yes, no. Do you want to do these things? You can just point out, Hey, there's this possibility for hanging out, uh, with other kids. Um, there's this soccer league or there's whatever, whatever that you think he might be interested in. Just point out their existence conversationally, not with a yes, no, you should say yes to this because you want to hang out with kids more. And I also wanted to touch on a couple of things that jumped out for me in that original question. So one was that you mentioned asking him to not get your phone from your purse and he grabs it anyway. Uh, when you know there's something that he's likely going to want to do, don't set him up to go against your wishes, right? Don't set him up to fail. Help him do that thing. So offer your phone up front. Would that make him smile? You know, at a minimum, don't set him up against you. If you truly, really didn't want him to get the phone and you knew he'd be tempted, then put it in your pocket. Take the temptation away entirely. Don't set him up. Don't tempt him. 
And the other was the comparison between that week-long trip away and your everyday home. That was a novelty. It was a different location. It was different possibilities. There was extra fun. And as I was reading it, unless it isn't, as some kids don't enjoy being away, you know, it could have gone completely differently. You don't know. Um, So it's unrealistic to envision that if you just didn't have a computer and the internet, that's the kid that you would have every day at home. That's, that is um, just us projecting into the future. That's unrealistic. So I know that he's disappointed and that you're sad and that is all okay. I mean, you guys will be moving through it sometimes slowly, sometimes more quickly. You'll be zigging and zagging and dancing around this idea um, for for lifetime. That That is life. And sometimes we might discover that we've settled into a bit of a routine and clues like this from our children just remind us to be more proactive. Like I was talking about earlier, it's not about making suggestions and waiting for him to agree. We can just step out of our comfort zone for a while and see if our child wants to come with us too. Maybe we'll find that we like the view here. Just do things instead of offering and being rejected. Um, the same thing about, you know, not setting up temptations. Um, just set up possibilities. That's probably, that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> what about you, Anna? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh my goodness. I can feel your heavy heart too. I, know. I just thank you for sharing that with us. Um, you know, as you mentioned, having a sibling doesn't always mean roses. I chuckled a little bit at his characterization. (laughs) Um, Personalities can be quite different and needs for space and playing very different as well. And what I see is that it feels really big to him right now. And I think validating his big feelings are so important, but you don't need to take on those feelings. They are his. And so this is what we were talking about with the question before this weight you're taking, you'd literally said a heavy heart. You're taking on this weight of his And, you know, I'm wondering, it sounds like you might have some feelings of your own around this and maybe examining those separate from his experience would be helpful as you guys work through this. I think there may also be some space for sharing and talking about how we can create our own families and friends and cousins and how that can be really beautiful. And maybe there's a way that that you could provide childcare for another child that would provide him more of an all day companionship and see how he feels about that. You know, I would focus on finding friends and opportunities and bringing different things into his life because it sounds like that is what he's needing right now. Um, And also finding the way that two of you can connect and play together. You know, I was never really great at pretend play, but I really enjoyed playing games and reading to my children. And so those are things that we would do for hours. And yes, like Pam said, it's it's not like you have to present it as a, well, we're not going to have a sibling, but will you play this game with me? You know, like that doesn't need to (laughs) be part of the conversation. Just just add more of those things into your life. Take joy in the time that you spend with him and and fill that space with joy and connection. Um. I would look inside and see if there's a way to change your energy about it. That weight that we were talking about, you know, is there a way to, for you to release that there, that may involve working through your own feelings about not having more children first before you're able to find that new place. Um, but you don't have to take on all of his feelings as your own. You can be there to validate and listen without taking on guilt or blame He is expressing his feelings. And like Pam said, that is wonderful and just so beautiful that he's able to express those feelings to you. You can be there for him without taking on those feelings. And in fact, I would suggest that it's really important for him that you don't. He needs to be able to express his big feelings without worrying that you're going to take them on and become upset. I feel like that can be really unsettling for children. And as you came from a big family, I did just want to throw out there that I have several friends and family members who are only children and across the board, they're grateful for it. So while he may feel this way later in life, the same way that he feels now, it's just as likely that he won't and that it's really a passing feeling that I would say is is kind of just bubbling up as an underlying need. And so, you know, that's when I think it's really important to talk about the underlying need for a minute. You know, it's being expressed as needing a sibling, but maybe met in other ways. And like Pam said, 
you know, just start adding more time and more play dates and people coming over and more games and different things that you're doing together. And as you meet that need that he's having for connection, for deep connection, he's wanting this deep connection with time spent with people. And as that need is met, this surfacing issue of needing a sibling really may fade away. You know, that's often what we see when we, we deal with that underlying need. And so I think it can be a really helpful tool. I would fully validate without any buts or new solutions until he truly feels heard. And then I think you'll find he moves on to finding other solutions. And of course, I don't know exactly the conversation that you had, but just from what I've read, I'm wondering if you know, you're expressing, validating that he wants a sibling. But again, as you're taking on that weight, you're like, but, but we couldn't do it. And we're too old, or we didn't think about that, or we this, and it's that explaining and that, and that isn't really hearing him. So just giving him just full, you wish you had a sibling, you want someone here every day to play with. And what would that look like? And tell me what that would look like. And oh my gosh, that sounds fun. And, and this and that. And do you feel the energy of that differently? He can express that and talk through it. And once he feels truly heard, you may find that he's like, but you know what? I really like having Bob come over too. And that's really fun. And, and, and so, you know, you just don't know where that will lead, but let that space open up, give that space to really let him sit in that, that spot where he is right now without owning it and adding to the weight of it. And I think that can be hard at first because we do really want to solve things and because you're taking on the feelings and internalizing them. But when you can separate that out and just hear him and, and engage in that full validation, I think you'll find it becomes a lot easier. So those were my few thoughts about that. Uh, yeah, I, l- I love that piece. <laughs> Here we are again, is, is, is not needing to solve it right away. Right. Yeah, that space, right? And sitting with it, um, um, validating it, empathize with it without feeling that you need to jump to solve it, right? right? Yeah. I love that piece. There's the other piece that jumped out when you were talking is is the idea of a, a solution, right? Mm-hmm. To realize that what he's sharing is his solution. It's right. not his need, right? There are yep. needs underneath which have, he's come up with the solution is a sibling, a brother right. specifically, right? Right? Right. Um, <laughs> and and, and, like and said, we're like, caught trying you know. to solve that as his need, right? It's like, oh, right. he needs this, he needs this, this is what I need to solve. No, you know, you can absolutely validate. I love your idea of, of the, the conversations with him. What would that look like? And all that kind of, because in those conversations, you're going to find yes. what needs are underneath it that he's wanting to solve. And that's when you can start having some brilliant flashes of things you can, can do to meet those needs because sibling is not the only solution, the only way to meet them. It's just the one that he's focused on right now, right? Right. And maybe just something that's come to mind from something he's seen or whatever. But again, having having two <laughs> two children <laughs> and you have been three, I'm thinking, oh, bless his heart. Like, it's not going to work out that way. <laughs> so I just feel like you're right. Like, this is his eight year old solution. But what we can do is talk to him and get to that spot of, OK, this is what he's looking for. It's it's this deep, meaningful connection. It's this time with people. It's this whatever it is, you know, and you'll find that out as he's exploring that. And so, you know, don't just latch on to that one thing that he's decided is the solution. And I think you had a great point about her working on releasing her weight around it, because I think yeah. that's why she's feeling so caught in solving yes. that particular um, thing. You know, she jumped right to the sibling and, and the yeah. brother because it touched a nerve for her. Right. Right. So she's having a hard time moving past that to start looking at the underlying things because she's also stuck there. So I think that was a wonderful point. And that is the last question for this month. Thank you so much, Anna. It was a great time chatting with you. I love answering questions with you. <laughs> Me too. It's fun. <laughs> it's so fun. And just a reminder for everyone, there are links in the show notes to for the things that we've mentioned in the episode. And as always, if you would like to submit a question for the Q&A, just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and click on the link. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Bye.
Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the Tuck Talks. For six years, I hosted the Toronto Unschooling Conference. It was an amazing experience and I loved meeting many wonderful unschooling families. Though I no longer host the conference, the unschooling insights shared by the amazing speakers over the years are timeless. You can listen to all 25 talks for free on my website at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash conference. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.